All right, so hello everyone and welcome to today's online workshop. Today's topic, we'll be looking at how to facilitate or co-host an online workshop for the WordPress training team. So um, today's online workshop is about hosting online workshops. So it's a bit of an interesting topic, um, but we seem to have many people here who are interested in um, creating educational content for the WordPress community. So hopefully you'll find something um, valuable and informative in today's session. All right, um, as we get started, I have a question for everyone. How many people have visited the learn.wordpress.org website? So the learn.wordpress.org website, this is what the website looks like. How many people have visited this site before? Um, you can leave a yes or no in the Zoom chat here. Um, I said yes, Rico yes, Jonathan yes, Tanya yes, Javier yes. Okay, great. All right, I think that's everyone. All right, everyone's been to the Learn WordPress Red site. So I will just briefly mention we have four content types on the Learn WordPress website. Um, and unfortunately, there's not an easy way to find the four contents on the homepage here. If you click into any page, you'll then see a menu bar at the top and we list our four content types here. We have tutorials, which are pre-recorded five to 10 minute videos. We have online workshops, which are these live learning um, interactive sessions, usually about an hour long, uh, which people can sign up to and attend. We have courses, which are online courses, self-guided courses people can work, work through at their own pace. Um, and then we also have lesson plans. Lesson plans are for teachers of WordPress who want to teach other people. Um, so they can print out these lesson plans, take it to a class or a meetup group, and they can teach from that. So um, Learn has four types of content. And what we'll be looking at today are the online workshops. So today's focus is the online workshop, how people can facilitate and co-host online workshops. Um, so you've, you're all attending this online workshop right now. So everyone has been to one of these online workshops before. Um, but just to give an idea, let me share this link with everyone here. This is the online workshop page on the Learn WordPress website. And I'm just going to read this um, explanation at the top here. So online workshops are live sessions where you can learn alongside other WordPress enthusiasts. They are a safe zone where you can come as you are, develop new ideas, explore issues, ask questions, network over shared interests, exchange theories, collaborate on work, and thrive in uncertainty. And what I want to pick up here is this phrase here. They are a safe zone where you can come as you are. So the main goal of an online workshop is to create a safe space where anybody can come and learn or even share their knowledge with other people. Um, so the key word there is a safe space. And that is the main responsibility of an online workshop facilitator and co-host. So the facilitator and co-host, their main responsibility is to create that safe space where people can come and learn about something or even share their knowledge about something, something, ask questions, network with other people, all in a safe environment. So um, as we look into the details of what an online workshop facilitator and co-host are, keep in mind their main job is to create that safe space. Um, so we'll come back to that um, a bit later. But just going through um, this page, you'll see underneath, oh, actually at the top, we have two buttons here. The first one is apply to facilitate. And the second one is view recorded online workshops. Um, so we'll touch on this a bit later as well, but in order to become a facilitator or co-host, you have to first apply. And again, this ties into creating safe spaces. So the training team, the WordPress training team, vet applications to become facilitators and co-hosts just to make sure those people who are wanting to become facilitators or wanting to become co-hosts are people who can provide those safe spaces. Um, so um, not 
Mm, so anybody can apply. Anybody can apply to become a, a facilitator or co-host. And the training team make sure those people who apply um, are people who are safety focused. They, they love the community. They want to make sure anybody is welcome and able to contribute to these online workshops. The second button here um, links to recorded online workshops. So I'll quickly open that. This takes you to a page on wordpress.tv. So all online workshop recordings, or pretty much all recordings, are uploaded here to wordpress.tv um, and um, stored there for eternity, basically, so that anybody in the future can come and watch these recordings. Um, you then come down and you see we have a calendar with upcoming online workshops. Um, the goal, the ultimate goal the training team has is to have an online workshop running every hour, 24 hours, seven days a week, so that anybody could log on to learn WordPress at any time and there would be something going on where they can learn about WordPress. Um, you'll see we're not quite there yet. So we're, we are looking for more facilitators and co-hosts to help us achieve that dream of having continuous online learning always there for people to come and attend. Um, so hopefully after today's session, you will be interested in joining as a facilitator and co-host as well. All right, so you scroll a bit more down and there's an application form here to become a facilitator. Um, and what we're really looking at here, um, if you scroll down, it has your email address, your username, um, your meetup.com user profile link. Um, but the biggest box here is where can we find you online? Please share links to your websites and as many social media accounts as possible, uh, such as Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. So what we want to look at is your activity online um, before you apply. So we look at your social activity and we want to just make sure you have already been building safe spaces online um, with the people you interact with. Um, so it's not that, we're not going to go through every one of your Twitter posts and every one of your Facebook posts and like check everything. But what we want to see is that you have had some activity in whatever community it is, creating these safe spaces, making it engaging and inviting to other people. Um, and just to make sure you are able to do that here for the training team as well. Um, so we have a few more questions here. Um, and basically, yeah, at the bottom, it says um, you have to agree to um, you agree to the open source project volunteer expectations and code of conduct. Um, and this is basically talking about that safe space. Will you create this safe space? Make sure anyone is welcome, anybody can join, um, et cetera. So that is the online workshop page on the Learn WordPress website. Uh, which sort of gives you an overview of what we're going to be looking at today. Let me pause there once. Does anybody have any questions so far before we dive into the details more? All clear, Ali, Sanya, thank you. Thank you for the all clear. All right. So what we're going to be looking at today is the training team's handbook. So I'm going to copy this link and paste it in the Zoom chat. Um, and I highly recommend you bookmark this page. Um, this page, this, this handbook, the training team handbook has a lot of information. Um, you can have a look, you can see the table of contents down the left end. And I mean, already that's almost like 10 items. And then each of them open up to show even more pages. So uh, my recommendation is don't try to read through all the handbook at once. There's, there's too much information there. Um, but when you start contributing to the training team, you probably will have some questions about different processes in the team. So when that comes, you can use the search box here to search for different how-to guides or different guidelines um, within the handbook. So today, I'll be walking through the online workshops section of the handbook. Um, you'll see we have a few pages here. I won't be going through every single point in these pages, but I'll be using this as a guideline um, to explain to you what the facilitator and co-host roles are uh, for online workshops, all right? 
Um, so just making sure does everybody have, is, is everybody clear on what we're going to be doing today? On the online workshops page, um, this is like an overview of what online workshops are. You'll see, thank you, Kavya, for your thumbs up. Um, you'll see we actually have a video here. So I did today's session, this online workshop topic yesterday as well. And yesterday's online workshop recording is embedded here in the handbook. So in future, if anybody comes along and wants to become an online facilitator, there's a recording here walking through these processes for them. All right. Um, but let's look at the pages a bit more. So online workshops, we have, first of all, applying to facilitate. Um, we then have a page on planning an online workshop. So this is um, about planning the content of the online workshop. We have scheduling an online workshop, steps to schedule a Zoom meeting, and then how to host the online workshop, how to host it on the day. A page all for co-hosts on how they can co-host an online workshop. And then we have a resource page, tools for hosting. Um, and then after an online workshop, so after a workshop is done, what uh, facilitators expected to do. And then finally, we also have reviewing facilitator applications. So this ties back to the first page. So I mentioned before, online workshop facilitators and co-hosts uh, first need to apply before they can facilitate. And this is to make sure uh, the WordPress project is providing a safe space for people. So you'll see we have some different steps here for you to follow to apply. Um, but what's, what I really like about the WordPress project is we also publicly show what the review criteria is. So the training team is open it, um, and we already tell you how we're going to be reviewing your application. Um, so um, this, this lists um, different steps about what our training team administrators will do once they receive your application, what processes they go through. Um, so if you're interested in becoming an online workshop, you can also have a look here to see how we're going to be looking at your application. Um, but basically what we're, what we're looking for is, um, do you have experience providing safe spaces to people uh, where they can come and freely share their questions without being judged? Um, do you have that sort of presence um, already? Um, so yeah, that's, that, that is how to apply to facilitate. Um, any questions about the application process? Tanya, all good, thank you very much. All right, so once you've applied, it, it depends, um, it usually takes about a week to two weeks for the application to be cleared. So if you're interested in getting involved, um, I suggest you uh, make your application early so we can start that vetting process. Once your application has been accepted, next comes the planning and online workshop step. So again, this, this, um, this handbook page has a lot of steps here. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, um, but let me give you an overview of how this process goes. So first of all, online workshops, um, you decide what format you want. So are you going to make it a Zoom uh, online meeting where people interact like this? Or you can also have text-based meetings. So sometimes audio, video um, communication um, isn't accessible to every type of facilitator. Some facilitators uh, might be better off with a text-based session. Um, some attendees might be better off with a text-based online workshop. And the training team is open and welcome for people to try different formats in their online workshops. So far, I think we've found um, these Zoom-based um, video conferences, uh, the easy, not easiest, but um, I'd say the majority of online workshops so far have been this format. Um, but we are definitely open to any other formats people are interested in. Um, I know some people have used, for example, Google, Doc, Google Docs or Google Spreadsheets 
um, in an online workshop. So everybody sort of edits the same document at the same time. Um, some people have used like an online sticky note session where people write things in a sticky note, move them around and sort of have a brainstorming session. Um, sometimes you have people who present slides and so it's like a, a formal presentation. And then after uh, the presentation is over, they have a time for questions where people can answer the presenter different questions. So they can ask the presenter different questions. Um, we have formats like I'm doing today where um, we go through a handbook process together. Um, we, we've also had a format where people build a WordPress site there live. Um, Jonathan, you run sessions where you do coding live. And so um, people can watch you code and um, how you go through that. So really the format isn't set in stone. Like you can try any type of format you want. As long as it's creating an environment for people to come and learn about WordPress, um, the format is pretty open um, to any suggestions. The only thing we ask is that the topic you use for your session is a vetted topic. So um, what do I mean by that? I, we had a look before at the, uh, this page. So the learn, the learn WordPress website. And we said we have four types of content. For each of these content types, the content creator first submits a topic. And then the, we have a role called subject matter experts in the training team. These subject matter experts confirm this suggested topic is indeed WordPress related. It's valuable to the community. Um, it's relevant to the community. And they just make sure the topic is um, a topic worthwhile creating. Once they say, okay, we view that topic as a vetted topic, and then we create content on top of that. So this process applies to lesson plans, courses, online workshops, and tutorials. A topic is first suggested, it is vetted, and then it is turned into an online workshop. Um, so how do you how do you suggest a topic and how is the topic vetted? So um, this handbook page here lists a link to the training team's GitHub project board um, and all the different issue templates we have here. So you can either suggest a new topic and have that topic vetted, or you can choose from a topic that has already been vetted um, hasn't had an online workshop created for. So if you want to create a new topic and have that vetted, we have a topic ID GitHub issue template down here. So you would click get started. And then it has some different questions. Um, first of all, what is your topic title? What is the description? So you can give a bit more information about that topic. Who are your audience? So is this online workshop going to be for users? Is it going to be for developers? Is it going to be for contributors? Who is your intended audience? Um, and then learning objectives. What will the learner be able to do as a result of this content? So for example, for this online workshop I'm doing right now, the learning objective may be um, attendees will be able to apply to become a facilitator or co-host. Attendees will be, have, uh, will be able to plan schedule and execute an online workshop. Um, so something people can do as a result of attending your online workshop. And then it says content type. So again, we have four content types. So you would list here which content type this topic is for. Um, so you can write online workshop. Um, if this is about a specific WordPress version, and um, then you can type that version here. And then finally, will you be creating this content or not? So Hopefully this isn't too difficult. It's, a, it's almost like an outline of the online workshop you're going to be hosting. So once you've filled all that out, um, you can go down and submit the new issue. And then this will, um, this will, and then the subject matter experts of the team will come and check this for you. And they will see if it needs any modifying. Uh, but generally most of the topics we get suggested are accepted and then move on to the content development phase. 
Um, so that is the process you go to if you're wanting to do an online workshop on a brand new topic. Let me pause there for a moment. Does anybody have any questions about that? And you gave a thumbs up. Looks like we're all good. Javier gave a thumbs up. Thank you. All right. So that was if you're suggesting a brand new topic. <clears throat> However, um, you can also look through a list of topics that have already been vetted and create an online workshop on that. And I'll show you how to do that next. Um, so coming back to this planning online workshop handbook page, at the top here, it links to the GitHub Content Development Project Board. Uh, so let me close that window. All right, so this is what the training team uses to track our content development. Um, so at the beginning here, we have a ready to create column. And this column is a list of topics that have already been vetted and we're waiting for a content creator to turn into content. So you'll see, we already have 90 issues here. People can choose any content, uh, sorry, these topics have already been vetted and a content creator can choose any of these and just start making the, the content. Once a content creator starts making this, it moves to the drafts in progress column. And once um, somebody has created a draft, it then moves into the review in progress column. And then once it's in the review in progress, uh, the training team has editors who come and review the content um, give feedback um, and we like to have two or three reviews for every piece of content before it is published. Um, so that helps the content creators too because I mean it's easy to have like typing mistakes um, in your content and the editors sort of check for that before it goes live um, and also sometimes like you might get something wrong you might have misunderstood a concept or um, maybe what you're talking about was true for WordPress for example, 6.2, but an update has set, happened in 6.3, and so something has to change a bit in there. Um, so just having that review progress uh, process makes sure um, all our content is up to date. It's um, We try and get all our bugs and mistakes out before it goes live. And then finally, once the content has been published, it moves into the published or closed column. So, for online workshops, you can choose any topic in the ready to create column and create an online workshop on that. Or you can search for keywords here. Uh, for example, let's search for uh, navigation block. You can search for a keyword here and see if any issues pop up in the project board. So you'll see how to create a menu with the navigation block tutorial, how to create a menu with the navigation block lesson plan. So we see the topic, how to create a menu with the navigation block has already been vetted. Somebody's making a tutorial for it here. Somebody's making a lesson plan for it here. And you can create an online workshop for that as well. Um, if you want. The fact that this topic appears in this project board means the topic itself has been vetted already. So how to create a menu with the navigation block is a vetted topic. So you can then turn that into an online workshop. This, this section is a bit complicated, so I just want to make sure everybody understands. Um, you can choose any topic in the ready to create and turn that into an online workshop or you can find a topic that appears in any of these columns, which means it has already been vetted and turn that into an online workshop as well. Does that make sense to everyone? Jonathan, yep. Tanya, yes, great. So once you've chosen your topic, so, if, you, if you're suggesting a brand new topic, you can start from the topic idea issue, a GitHub issues template, a GitHub issue template. 
if you're choosing a topic that has already been vetted, then you can start with the online workshop template. All right. So if you're su suggesting a new topic, it has to be vetted first. So you use the topic idea um, template. Um, but if you're choosing a topic that has already been vetted, then you can start with the online workshop template. So let's open that template and see what it looks like. All right, and the information here is uh, pretty similar to the topic vetting template. So you would put your workshop title in the top here. For example, how to create a menu with the navigation block because that was already a vetted topic. Um, so you put the title here, you'd write a description, a bit more explanation about what that topic is um, and then target audience. So similar to the topic vetting, this would be like, is it aimed at developers? Is it aimed at designers? Is it aimed at users? Is it aimed at community members? Um, so you have your target audience. Now you come to date. Date, meetup.com event link, co-host, et cetera. And so this is where we jump back to the handbook. All right. So we've been talking so far about planning an online workshop. And this handbook page lists a few more steps for you. What you want to choose at this stage is, first of all, what format your online workshop is going to be. Is it tech-based? Is it video-based? Is it going to be a discussion? Is it going to be a presentation? Um, and then you'll also choose your topic. So if it's a new topic, you'd submit that so it gets vetted. If it's a pre-vetted topic, you can just start creating the online workshop for it. So that's planning an online workshop. Once you've planned your online workshop, we now move on to scheduling an online workshop. And this is where you start thinking about the more specific details, like what date and time are you going to host this? Um, and so that ties into this section. So the date, the meetup.com event link, et cetera. Everybody who has joined today's session probably knows all our meetup, uh, all our online workshop, all our meetup, uh, all our online workshops appear on the Learn WordPress meetup group. So if you are a facilitator, when you make the event, um, you will come and add the event to meetup.com. The other location the meetup shows up is on the Learn WordPress website. So on the website, I showed you there's a calendar here with all our events. Um, a facilitator, when they schedule their event, they will also add it to this calendar. So there are two locations you add your event to. You add it to the Learn WordPress calendar and you add it to the um, Learn WordPress meetup.com group. Um, you need special access to do this, but that access will be given to you at the beginning when you apply to become a facilitator. So facilitators will be given access to meetup.com. They'll also be given access to learn.wordpress.org. And so they'll be able to add their events here. Um, and then the, the specific steps of how to add your event um, is listed under this page, scheduling an online workshop. So you'll see the topics are create your event on meetup.com and add your event to the Learn WordPress calendar. Um, so I won't go into details, but the steps are all listed out here. So you follow these steps um, to add your event to two locations. Once they're added, you come back to your GitHub issue and you list the date here and you list the meetup.com event link here. So other people uh, know this event has been scheduled. Um, so yeah, so that's planning an online workshop and scheduling an online workshop. Ah, something I will mention, <clears throat> so coming back to the meetup.com page, um, when you joined this session today, you probably clicked on the link that shows here, the Zoom link that shows here. So this is a Zoom link to the online event. Zoom is a really good um, online conferencing tool. Um, it has a lot of features. Um, it has a lot of safety features as well. So um, you can catch like inappropriate words in the chat or you can block people or kick them out and different things like that. Doesn't happen often, but we do have some people who somehow get into our sessions and they don't follow normal guidelines regarding community. So. Um, we do need those safety features. However, 
Zoom only gives 40 minutes for free in, in a call. So um, a lot of our online workshops are an hour long. Um, so that needs a paid Zoom account. But what I want to mention is you don't need to pay for an account yourself. The training team owns a paid Zoom account, which we can lend to online workshop facilitators when they host online workshops for the training team. Um, so even if you don't own a Zoom account, you can reach out to a training team member and we'll be able to share the details with you uh, regarding our Zoom account. And that information is listed in the next handbook page. So the next one was steps to schedule a Zoom meeting. Um, these steps, it says here, these steps are for scheduling a meeting on the training team faculty Zoom account. So if you don't own a Zoom account, but you want to use Zoom for your online workshop, um, we're here and ready to help. Again, I won't go through all these steps here, uh, but we've listed out the steps you need to follow um, in order to schedule your Zoom account, uh, sorry, your Zoom meeting. Zoom will give you a link, which you can then copy and paste into your meetup.com event um, so that when people come on the day, they have a link they can click and join your meeting. All right, so we've covered applying to facilitate, planning an online workshop, scheduling an online workshop, how to schedule a Zoom meeting. Any questions so far? Looks good. All right. So now we finally get to hosting an online workshop. Ah, sorry. One more thing I was going to say is um, it's good practice to have your online workshop up, scheduled, and on this online workshop calendar as early as possible. Um, so for example, if you put the event up on the Learn WordPress calendar for a session that's starting in an hour, not many people are going to be able to see that event and sign up. Um, it's usually good to have the event up two or three weeks in advance um, so people can arrange their schedule and make sure they get there. Me personally, um, I do um, around four online workshops each month. Um, it's about the 15th of the previous month where I look at my calendar for the next month and I plan out what online workshops I'm going to do, and I try to add my event a month in advance. Um, so if you're going to um, facilitate an online workshop for the first time, remember the application process takes about one to two weeks, and then you want to have your event published one to two weeks before the event as well. So you are looking at starting the whole process a month or so in advance. Um, so that's just a point I wanted to pull out, um, draw out there. Um, if, it, if you're brand new, then you want to get started on this process as early as possible. All right, so now hosting an online workshop. So you've scheduled the event, you've planned the event, you're finally hosting an online workshop. And you'll notice in our hosting an online workshop page, the very first thing we say is work with a co-host. So now I, I want to talk about the co-host role a bit. Um, so a co-host is known as a moderator or a buddy or a helper, um, can he help your online workshop go more smoothly. Um, and then it says, please see co-hosting online workshop for more details about the role of a co-host. So the co-host, I think is a very important role for online workshops. When the training team started online workshops, um, facilitators usually did this alone. Um, and sometimes you have a quiet online workshop and it goes okay, but sometimes people get really enthusiastic and energized and you have lots of people asking questions in the chat and you have people unmuting themselves and asking questions and there's just a whole lot going on. And so for some facilitators, it got a bit overwhelming. Um, and so that's when we introduced the co-host role. So a co-host does a few things. Um, what does a co-host do? So a co-host does a few things. First of all, they admit attendees from the Zoom waiting room. So when you join today, you probably notice there's a Zoom waiting room. Um, but me, the host, while I'm, while I'm talking here and showing presentations and doing different things, 
it's um, a bit too much for me to also keep an eye on the Zoom waiting room and admit people when they join. So Asad, my co-host today, has been keeping an eye on that and letting people in when they join. Um, so that's a big help. Um, another one is greet newcomers and late arrivals. So um, sometimes like I might be talking about something or I've shared a link. Um, something about the Zoom chat is people who join the Zoom chat afterwards don't see what's going on in the chat beforehand. And so if I've shared an important link first and somebody joins after, they don't see that link. And so a co-host can then reshare that link with the new people to make sure everybody knows what we're talking about and we're all on the same page. Another thing the co-host can do is make sure the host's audio and presentations are coming through correctly and let the host know when they are not. So, so far today, it looks like my audio and my video are working smoothly, but technical issues happen. Um, lightning can strike and your computer dies or um, you might have accidentally pressed mute and people can't hear you. Um, and so something the co-host can do is just keep an eye to make, make sure everything's going smoothly. And if something isn't, they can point that out to the host and let them know. Um, so something else they can do is make sure the session is getting recorded um, or respond to anything needing immediate action in the chat. Um, and then look for presented, uh, look and present related information to what the speaker is talking about. So um, the way online workshops are structured is people can ask questions and answer each other's questions. Uh, the facilitator doesn't have to know all the answers. They don't have to answer every single question. So if somebody asks a question in the Zoom chat while the facilitator is talking and the co-host knows the answer, then they can go ahead and answer that question for the user um, and um, share a link, a relevant link with them. Um, so they can sort of help the facilitator by keeping an eye on the chat and providing information as needed. Um, and then we have a few more items here. And I also wanted to point out the last one. If an attendee does not follow the code of conduct, send them a warning. In extreme cases, if they do not modify their behavior after receiving a warning, then removing them from the workshop may be necessary. So um, sometimes um, you can have someone who gets really engaged with the topic and they start asking lots of questions or, whoops, they start asking lots of questions or um, they start to dominate the conversation and take over from the facilitator. And when that happens, a co-host can start a, a private chat with them in the Zoom chat feature. So um, you may be aware, Zoom chat, you can type a message to everyone all at once, or you can type to a certain person. And so sometimes when, when there's a really energetic, active contributor like that, um, if the co-host can engage in a private conversation with them in the Zoom chat, they can channel that contributor's excitement in a productive way there without interrupting the main facilitator and what they're doing. Um, so that is one thing the, the co-host can do. And sometimes in, in extreme cases, a, an attendee might do something that's inappropriate. Like um, they might they might make a bad comment about someone, like a personal insult. Um, and that's not accepted in the WordPress community. If somebody does that, the co-host can point out and say, that doesn't follow our con a code of conduct. Please refrain from comments like that. Um, a a co-host is allowed to and is encouraged to say that if a situation like that happens. Sometimes people don't follow that, like they don't follow that advice. Um, or sometimes they just, they just start um, like showing inappropriate things on their screen or start playing inappropriate audio. In cases like this, the co-host has the ability to remove that person from the online workshop. I will say it's never happened to one of my sessions. Um, maybe one in a hundred. Um, it's, it's very rare. It doesn't happen that often. Um, but when it happens, I mean, nobody is planned for it. Um, it happens suddenly. So a co-host just has that ability to make sure the place is a safe space for anyone. And if somebody tries to damage that safety, 
then the co-host has the ability to remove them from the workshop. And that's why we vet co-hosts as well. At the beginning, I said you need to apply to become a facilitator, but you also need to apply to become a co-host because you are also responsible to keep that safe, that online workshop space, a safe space for the attendees. Um, so, wow, that sounds like a lot there. <laughs> um, but something I wanted to point out is a co-host doesn't need to know the topic of the online workshop. So, um, so for example, if the topic is about um, WordPress APIs, Jonathan, I know you do online workshops about, on workshops about WordPress APIs. I really don't know a lot about WordPress APIs. Um, but that doesn't mean I can't become a co-host for Jonathan's session. Um, the co-host doesn't need to know the topic about what's going on. Again, their main responsibility is to make sure the online workshop is a safe space and it goes smoothly with as, with as little technical problems as possible. Um, their role is to assist the facilitator. So um, if you find an online workshop that um, works for your time, but you don't know the topic, that's still okay. Um, we encourage you to come and join as a co-host for that online workshop. Now, there's, there's a link we should add to this handbook page. It doesn't exist here. So I'm going to share it with everyone in the Zoom chat, but there is a way to find all um, online workshops that don't have a co-host right now. Um, so do, 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 what's the best way to do that? Let's come over here. Um, so I know this because um, I do this all the time, but needs co-host, there we go. All right, let me, say, let me share this link with everyone in the Zoom chat and we should definitely add this to the ham. Um, these are online workshops that need a co-host. All right, so if you click on that link, you'll see here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven online workshops and they have this label here, the needs co-host. These online workshops all still need a co-host. So if you're interested in becoming a co-host, um, first of all, apply to become a co-host and then have a look through these GitHub issues to see which online workshops still need a co-host. Um, of course, online workshops happen in different time zones all throughout the day. So you'll have to see if, um, which sessions are hosted in a time that suits you. Um, but if you find one, um, and your application to become a co-host has been accepted, um, then um, please, please um, comment on the GitHub issue and say, I want to be a co-host for you. Um, Asad, I think you've co-hosted almost 10 online workshops now, maybe. Um, Asad, it has um, been a great co-host. Eight, yeah. eight, eight, okay. Um, and so yeah, the more you co-host, the more you get used to it. Um, and so, yeah, I strongly encourage people, if you're interested in facilitating, but maybe it seems like a big jump, um, start by co-hosting. So you can, get, uh, you can get the feel of what it means to work with the facilitator, how it, how it feels to um, be part of the team, to host an online workshop. And then after you co-host a couple of times and get a bit more confident, then you can also start facilitating your own sessions. All right, so that was a lot of information about co-hosting online workshops. Let me pa pause there. Does anybody have any questions about that? Tanya, all good? I, I like these reactions, like the thumbs up and the all good comment. Um, that, that helps me make sure um, what I'm saying is getting across to people. Ali, thank you for your thumbs up. All right, now um, I'm, go I'm going to skip over this one, the tools for hosting. Uh, I mentioned you can host an online workshop in different formats, and this page gives you um, some tools you can use for your online workshops. Um, the last one I want to look at is the after an online workshop handbook page. <clears throat> so a after a facilitator has conducted an online workshop, there are three things we ask of ask the facilitator to do. The first one is record the attendance. So this is the manual process right now. Um, there's a link to a Google spreadsheet here, which looks like this. Everybody has access to this page. 
and you'll see we have a record of all the online workshops that have been conducted this year. Actually, if you click over here, you'll see all the online workshops that have ever been conducted. Um, we started in 2021, February 2021, it looks. So we've been doing this for uh, two and a half years now. The training team has been doing this for two and a half years. So for each of these events, let's come to the very bottom here. Um, you'll see there's a date and then there's a meetup URL. So that, that link is the link of the meetup event up here. So you'd paste that in. It then says language. Um, and so this is something else I want to point out. Online workshops can be hosted in any language. You'll see up here we have a couple of JAs. This is short for Japanese. Um, me and another contributor, we try and um, host an online workshop in alternating months. So there's a Japanese online workshop happening every month for the community there. Um, and we'd like to see more languages host online workshops as well. So if you speak another language, um, you're welcome to host an online workshop in your language too. Um, you then type the topic. And then over here, we have two columns, RSVP and total attendees. So RSVP is the number of people who said they want to attend. And you can get this by going to meetup.com. And if you scroll down here, under the event, you'll see 13. So 13 people signed up for this event and said they wanted to attend. Um, so once this session is done, I will add 13 um, under RSVP. Then total attendees is the actual number of people who came to this event. Um, so as I said, how, how, ma how many has been the number of people who attended this time? Um, the highest number was today for nine and the lowest was seven. The highest number was, sorry, how many? Uh, nine. Nine people. All right. And you notice I haven't been keeping track of the attendees. I asked Asad beforehand um, that he would keep track of how many people attended so um, he can help me to record this number. So over here, I'd write 13. Over here, I'd write nine. And then the next one is the wordpress.tv link. And so let me jump back to the handbook. Um, I mentioned these sessions are recorded and then the recording is uploaded to wordpress.tv. Uh, that is the second thing you do after an online workshop is done. You upload the recording to wordpress.tv. Um, again, we have um, steps for how you would do this. Um, but once you've uploaded the recording, you would get that link from wordpress.tv and add that to the spreadsheet as well. So not too difficult. It's just to help us keep a record of what online workshop has have happened and how many people have attended. So once you've done those two things, the final thing is submit feedback about the experience. So this is for the facilitator to share feedback of their experience facilitating online workshops. Um, so how did the process go? Was it, was it, was it difficult? Was it easy? Um, are there any improvements you can suggest? Uh, for example, when I mentioned when we start, we didn't have co-hosts, um, but a need, some people were saying they were having difficulty in an online workshop and they sent us feedback that it would be great to have a co-host. And so that feedback got implemented and now we have co-hosts in many of our online workshops. And so the training team is open to feedback. So once you facilitate a session, um, please send us feedback and we'd like to make improve this process even more. Um, and then finally, we won't go into too much detail, um, but I also want to um, draw your attention to the resources section of the training team handbook. So, so far we've been looking at the online workshop section. We also have a resource section that applies to all the different content types. The first one here is the training team accessibility checklist. So the training team, we try to make all our resources as accessible as possible. And recently we've um, published a new accessibility checklist that will help you as you prepare for your online workshop. Um, especially if you're going to uh, be using slides um, or any other resources, it will be, um, it's a good idea to look through this accessibility checklist first to make sure your slides are as accessible as possible for the people who will attend. Another one we have here is brand usage guidelines. So 
in the training team, when we create the content, we don't promote uh, any brand. We, um, so for example, we don't do a lot of workshops that focus on one specific plugin. We might do a workshop about creating a contact form, but when we do, we'll mention um, here are three or four different plugins you can use to make a contact form. We won't just focus on one. We'll always try to mention multiple brands. Um, and this is to make sure we are fair to all people who contribute to the WordPress project. Um, so if you're going to facilitate the session, have a look to the brand usage guidelines as well. And one more, the promotional guidelines. So something we ask online workshop facilitators is, this isn't a place for you to promote yourself. This is a place where we uh, we want people to learn about WordPress. So um, online workshop facilitators are welcome to share, for example, like their social network links, um, their Slack account details once somewhere in the online workshop. But um, this isn't a place for you to promote yourself. So we don't want it like flashing in the background the whole time, like come to my website, come to my website. or buy my product, buy my product. Um, so this page here gives you um, a guideline of what you can do and uh, can't do to promote yourself or your product. Um, you notice I promote the WordPress logo here on my Waku collection. Um, you're, you're free to um, promote WordPress um, because that's what we're all about. Um, but if, you're, uh, if you want to share your personal information and how people can connect with you, um, please have a look at these promotional guidelines. Um, yeah, so those are the additional resources I want to point out, wanted to point out. And that brings us to the end of the content I had prepared for today's online workshop. Um, thank you all for listening. Are there any final questions or comments people want to slip in before we finish off here? Tanya have a, has a thumbs up. Thank you. Asad, you have a comment. Sure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, hopefully, today I've been able to share um, information on what an online workshop is, what an online workshop facilitator does, um, and also what an online workshop co-host does. Um, so, yeah, um, if you have any other questions, um, if you're part of the WordPress Slack group, then you'll find me and other workshop facilitators in the training channel. Um, so you can access that. If you don't have access to the WordPress Slack group, you can also um, send a, your questions in a comment on the event here or in the event chat, and I will be able to answer your questions there as well. All right, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Thank you for co-hosting our site. And um, I look forward to seeing everybody in an online workshop in future. Thank you for your day, uh, for your time. Have a good day. You too. Have a good day. Thank you.